Howdy, folks. Welcome to uh, the show today. Um, just a quick point of admin before we get started. This is actually going to be the penultimate um, show in uh, season one. So uh, that's to say that next Thursday is going to be the, the finale, is going to be the last show of the first season before we wrap it up um, for the Christmas holidays. Um, in the new year, there's going to be a second season. Uh, I'm actually going to buy a proper camera. I'm going to buy a proper microphone, proper lighting, proper everything. And I'm actually going to um, try and, and uh, produce a semi-competent uh, show. Thanks to all of you guys for your support, for sharing the videos, for subscribing, for rating the podcast. All of your support is very much appreciated. Uh, so today, uh, my guest is a lady called Katia, or Kate, as, she, as she's sometimes known. Kate is based in Barcelona, um, and she is uh, a teacher who, as who um, specializes in um, CAE and uh, FCE. Um, Kate wanted me um, to know that she was pretty nervous about coming on the podcast, so um, it doesn't show at all. Um, she did really well, so uh, let's all uh, show our support by listening to her and uh, letting her know how well she did. We talked about all sorts of crazy stuff, uh, including the standard sort of English grammar topics. We talked about the difference between Cambridge and, and IELTS and all of that sort of thing. We talked about factorial numbers and their mathematical consequences um, and loads of other topics. So without further ado, here's Kate. <laughs> Okay, now that I've deleted enough files off my computer, three, two, one, and hello. Um, Hi. You, sorry, I didn't even ask you, do you prefer uh, Katya or Yukajirina? Mm, it's better, maybe Kate, because I'm used to my students talk, uh, talking to me, referring okay. to me as Kate. Kate. Kate it is. Kate, Catherine, whichever. All right, how are you today? Oh, I'm great, but a little bit sad. I guess. Okay. <laughs> well, I had uh, my last class with my group, C group. It's Aww. 50th lesson, you know, it's all emotional. Mm -hmm. I will miss them, they will miss me, so yeah. Well, you know, the solution to that is uh, teach them CPE is <laughs> the next step. Yeah, true. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's, um, it is emotional um, parting ways with a class. Um, I find that very often with um, lower levels when I used to teach sort of elementary, pre-intermediate, because um, the sort of stuff that you're teaching them, these are really fundamental building blocks in their, in their language. And to sort of go with them on that journey and to just see the, is, there's nothing better. It's like kids' faces when they open their presents at Christmas, to see suddenly that it clicks and they, ah, of course, and they, they suddenly realize that. Do you find that those moments become rarer and rarer the higher level you get, or is it the opposite? I, you know, I think that anyway, there is this uh, kind of feeling of finishing the book. You, I am proud of them. They are proud of themselves, I hope, and they are. So the, the progress is great. So mm -hmm. there is nothing better, you know, finishing the book, going and maybe taking the exam. Some of them, yeah. some of them don't. But uh, anyway, they, mm -hmm. there is progress. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, all, all I mean to say is that I think that the, the higher, it's kind of paradoxical because the higher level you become, the, the less tangible your progress becomes. Um, you know, for example, at, at CAE or CPE level, um, you know, the topic for a lesson might be, okay, here are some collocations about how we discuss this one particular topic when talking about the environment in these dialects of English um in 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 british english it's just such a, a microscopic topic that when you finish studying that you're like okay i just i just learned another another quarter of an inch 
worth of dictionary material whereas at you know elementary or pre-intermediate just the things that you'd like present simple present perfect huge swaths of language which then suddenly you can express is you know much more you know the, the moment that you learn let's say first conditional the, your your world has just expanded um infinitely almost in terms of the amount of, of, of stuff you can express um, but then, you know, when you finish a whole chapter of CAE preparation, it's just, okay, now you're slightly better at talking about this very exact topic. Mm, you know, it's, it's, I think it's about the perspective, because I always say that, okay, now, after having finished this uh, module, you can speak about the environment in a more advanced way or work, education, success, you know, this and that. You can speak about advantages and disadvantages and whatever, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, this and that. About Tom and about Siom, as they say. <laughs> yeah, so um, why don't you go ahead and um, tell us a little bit about your, about your group, about your page. What's it called? Where can we find it? What sort of content do you have on there? Mm, well, well, it's, I don't, oh, okay, suddenly I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's called uh, Cambridge Exams with uh, Yaka, the teacher. Yeah, so nobody knows what it, what it is. So, uh, I mean, everyone mispronounces that. I guess they read it the way they like it to be, but it doesn't matter. So I'm mm -hmm. there. So, well, I started this page about two years ago when I started preparing for CP. And uh, yeah, I talked about my progress, about things I, I do for my speaking and uh, my language development. And then I guess it just took off. Yeah, and then every, everyone joined in. Well, yeah, you're, you're certainly one of, the, one of the larger pages out there in terms of Cambridge preparation. So uh, yes, congratulations. Um, Thanks. So things that you did to practice your speaking, <laughs> for example, what sort of stuff did you do to practice your speaking? Well, I, well, I guess uh, the first thing that springs to mind is uh, group preparation classes with Vladimir, because I, so I, used, I studied in three groups, and then there were two groups for a year or so. So speaking practice, you know, all this language development, etc. So I think it helped me a lot, mm -hmm. mostly that. So, yeah. Speaking, I don't really know. I don't really know what to do now. I'm trying to listen to Blinkist, retell it. I don't know whether you know about Blinkist. I do, yeah. Blinkist is an interesting thing. For, for people who don't know what Blinkist is, would you go ahead and, and summarize it for us? Oh, I don't know, even know how to uh, how to put it, how wonderful this program is. I, I absolutely love it, honestly, because so, it's, yeah, it's everything that we need. The, the idea is that um, Blinkist take um, mostly non-fiction books and they condense them down into 15 minutes, uh, they call them blinks, so 15 minute chunks, um, so basically synopses of, of books, so for example you could take, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure they've got like, you know, Sapiens, which, I'm, which is on every bookshelf of every country ever, um, th so you can like listen to the blink it's an audio format i think you can read it as well but most people listen mm -hmm. and the idea is that when you listen to the to this uh, synopsis you remember everything about the book that you would have remembered if you had read the entire book because like i, I read this like a year ago i mean i remember some stuff about like you know about wheat and about the agricultural revolution and something about the pope and something about Peugeot's but um, apart from that, I don't, I, you know, probably if I just listened to the, to the blink, then I would have understood just as much. Mm. Yeah, and I tell to my students that it's everything that we need in terms of vocabulary, grammar, uh, you know, we, you should notice how they put it all nicely. I especially like uh, the fact that maybe there is, uh, the editor is the same, but uh, because they like certain clications, like pivotal role or something like that, so you can hear it very, really often. Mm -hmm. um, it's just beautifully put. Yeah, and um, you can... I, I, I feel exactly the same way about things like, um, like podcasts, um, which is part of the reason why I decided to launch one. Um, it's just, it's, you know, if you told anyone, you know, 10, even seven years ago that 
one of the most popular forms of media these these days is going to be basically on demand radio they would have thought you were insane like no one saw this po podcast um revolution coming um but it's 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 um it's not surprising at all because you look at how our, our you know the way that we consume media how that shifted throughout the ages these days the idea of watching my news on television or watching any entertainment on television for me is just so inconvenient like you're going to tell me when this program starts and you're going to put a load of adverts in the middle and you're going to tell me when I need to watch it and on what days. Yeah, no thanks. I will choose when I want to watch TV. I'm going to choose what I want to watch and what I want to listen to. Um, yeah, thank God for the free market, eh? <laughs> well, actually, I had this question. I, I listened to all of your podcasts, but I might have missed it. So how did you come up with the idea? It's just... Um, well, I mean... Thanks for the question, and thank you very much for listening. I'm, I'm, you, <laughs> I was going to say something actually when you mentioned. Uh, you, you, did I understand you correctly? You studied with uh, Vladimir Pavlovich, yeah. And yeah, there's not a single podcast where that man doesn't come up. Okay, so here's a message, Vladimir, if you're listening, get out of my podcast and do your homework. <laughs> I thought the same actually today. I was thinking that uh, I, I will, I, he will come up anyway. He's, he's like a spider. He's everywhere, mm -hmm. and all of his. Tentacles and spiders, sort of tentacles, what I'm talking about. All of his um, his web and his legs are just creeping inside of my podcast. But yes, stop listening, Volvo. Turn it off right now. Go and do your homework. And we'll discuss it on Tuesday. Um, but yeah, to answer your original question, how did I come up with the idea? I mean, I don't really know. It's I mean, I, I don't really consider myself to have um, done anything super original here. Perhaps it's... Um, original in the sense that I think no, no one's ever done a podcast before where um, it's like I'm interviewing guests from different parts of the ESL community especially on VK so that's obviously um, in, in, in the Russian teaching community because um, I think first of all because you know I, I have a connection with Russia uh, and you know most of the teachers I know are Russian obviously um, but um, yeah, it seemed, it seemed like a super obvious um, idea for me. I mean, it's, um, of course, part of my motivation was to spread the word about my speaking club. So there is a marketing motivation as well. But you, you can, if, if you don't make, you know, something that's interesting to listen to and you don't make something that people want to engage with and want to download, then, you know, your marketing is not going to have any uh, clout. So um Yes, of course, there is a selfish motivation so I can get people to join, hear about my speaking club and join. And I, I get money, which is great. The podcast, you know, I, I don't get any money from the podcast. Um, but um, yeah, it's um, it was because I think some people have done it before. Like, um, I cannot remember this woman's name. Oh, what's she called? Sort of blonde, curly hair. She's very well known in the ESL community. I can't remember her name, but um, yeah, anyway, that woman, she's got like 80,000 followers. Um, she sometimes does like, you know, an interview with like, um, you know, oh, here's an interview with some IELTS examiner and here like, or with, you know, Qdella or someone like that. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. But you know, how interesting is that going to be like after the first hour? I don't know. Sometimes I talk about IELTS and Cambridge exams, but other times... You know, we talk about all sorts of stuff on this podcast. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I think... Especially enjoyed the one about Russian, uh, Russian traditions with your um, uh, friend who is also a teacher. We, um, which you mean with Mike Walker? Yeah. Oh, about, um, about the Russian mentality. Yeah, Russian mentality, yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, I, was, I was really worried about putting that out because I didn't want people to get the... Because a lot of the time, Russians, again, this is going to be, I don't know if this is controversial, but like Russians love criticizing the government. Russians love making fun of and joking about their own country. But the moment that a foreigner tries to do it, that's when the defense mechanisms kick in. You say, what are you, a Russophobe or something? As if anyone who says anything critical about Russia must be a Russophobe. There's no other explanation. Um, so I was worried about that. But the, re the reception has been pretty good. And, and I think people understood that um, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't trying to be nasty or, or, you know, unduly critical of Russia. I just, you know, I get annoyed when people use that 
that argument. Do you, do you, I mean, did, did you agree with me? Did you know what I mean? Or did you think that I, I was um, a bit mistaken? Well, just an interesting perspective. I think that is just uh, I don't uh, I don't really know where I stand here. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in term, I don't really communicate with Russians much, only with my students. So we discuss, you know, general topics. So I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's strange to say that. Honestly, it's it is strange to say that, but I don't really don't really know because a and I also live in Spain. No. Ah, uh, yeah, you're you're in Barca, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Very nice. I can say a lot about Spanish people. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> mm, mm, the food is great. Let's be let's be positive. <laughs> the food is great. The well, weather I... is great. Mm -hmm. But the service, you know, all this delivery, uh, whatever, is just terrible compared to Moscow mm -hmm. and Russia. Yeah, there. Um... Yeah, well, Moscow and Russia, they're, they're kind of two different concepts when you, when you talk about services and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I lived for a short time in Spain. I, I used to live in um, Cadiz, in, in the south of Spain, when I, I was there for a, for a summer doing uh, research for my dissertation. Um, yeah, and um, without wanting to sound berserkly racist or Hispanophobic, they are lazy people. <laughs> they are unbelievably lazy. Um, you know, I think it's it's kind of depends. Uh, it depends. It all depends. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very strange. For example, um, the fact that uh, I don't know in Moscow, say you call uh, and you will get this thing or this service or whatever uh, just the next day. But here it takes some time. You need to be patient. Mm -hmm. But that is Moscow. Are, are you from Moscow originally? Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, so I mean. With all you know, respect that that's Moscow. Um, um, have you spent any time living in like, other cities in Russia? Or? Yeah, I also lived. Uh, uh, I also lived in uh, Eastern Turkey for three years, but I don't remember. I was really, really young. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of my whole experience is Moscow mostly. Like, yeah, it's um, it's it is different depending on where you go. Obviously, um, I mean, even somewhere like Chumen. Chumen is a very. It's a lot of money there. The, the uh, Chubinska almost is one of the richest regions in all of Russia outside of Moscow. That's because it's the administrative center of the oil and gas industry in Russia. So you've got all of these, you know, the oil fields like, you know, this um, Zamatvor and stuff, is, that, that's in like this um, in the Ugra region. Um, but in Tumen, you've got a lot of administrative centers. So companies like, um, you know, Halliburton and uh, Slumberger, Rosneft, uh, Gazpromneft, all, all of those companies, they've got their, you know, their accounting and their HR and their operations and their drilling people all in Tumen. And there's a lot of money in Tumen. And because there's a lot of money, there follows a lot of, um, a lot of goods and services and stuff like that. But <laughs> when it comes to um, things that you want delivered, uh, or, or things that, um, for example, like government services. I um, so when I when I, I was getting uh, married to my wife, um, it's a very complicated process. So first of all, for any any young gentleman listening who wants to get married to a Russian girl, maybe do it in the UK because it's a nightmare in Russia. So first of all, I needed to go to Yekaterinburg uh, to get a certificate from the British consulate. Then I needed to get that translated and notarized in Moscow. So I had to go to this uh, MID in Moscow personally. You can't post it. You can't send it by courier. I, so from Chumen to Shirimichiva is a, is a three hour flight. I flew to Moscow, um, tried to call the, the MID before to make an appointment. No one picks the phone up. There's no information on the website. So I said, okay, I'm flying to Moscow. I flew to Moscow, got on the uh, Air Express, got two metros, got a taxi, whatever, and then went to the place, a little bit of paper in the window saying we're closed for four days. No call center, no information on the website. I'm like, okay, I guess fuck me then. And I went back to Tumen. I mean, what am I, what am I gonna do? Shout at the Russian government? <laughs> and I, I, nothing I could do. I went back to Tumen and I was like, there's such typical, no offense to people from Moscow, but that's such typical Moscow attitude. Everything happens in Moscow. Moscow is the center of Russia. And if you don't like it, well, you know, <laughs> that's um, so, yeah, that, that kind of thing annoys me. But um, 
yeah you you, you are right there's uh, it's um, so why two men and not uh, Moscow or St. Petersburg they were, would be more obvious choice for I don't know teaching exploring Russia I don't know why did you choose this city for teaching maybe for exploring Russia I don't know I don't know that I, I don't know just uh, when you think Russia is St. Petersburg Moscow the first first cities that come up um Possibly. I mean, so anyone who really wants to get to know Russia, I would I would not advise to go to St. Petersburg. Because um, that, that's a very particular view of Russia during a very particular period of Russian history. Um, Moscow, perhaps. But again, it's not a real representation of what Russia really looks like, don't you think? Um, but to answer your question, that wasn't really my thinking. My thinking was, so I, I've, I have lived in Petersburg before. Um, so when I studied at university, when we, when I did this year abroad, I went to uh, Yaroslavl and also to St. Petersburg to study. Um, so I'd, I'd lived in Petersburg for a long time and I, I love St. Petersburg. It's one of the most beautiful cities I've ever visited, not just in Russia, but in the world. Um, but then when I was finishing university and my plan was to move back to Russia to find a job, um, I tried to avoid those two big cities, Moscow, Petersburg. I kind of felt like, okay, I've been there. I've by no means seen the whole place, but you know, still, I think I've, you know, I've, I've got a good idea of what it's like in the west of Russia. Now, I'd like to, for example, explore. I looked at um, where did I look at? Um, there was a job in uh, Volgograd, I think. A job in um, I can't remember where Kaliningrad, and then one job in Tumen. I thought, oh, Siberia, that sounds like fun, and. Uh, and it was. It was very fun. And Have very cold. Been, was it? No, no, unfortunately not. But could be an interesting experience, you know, minus 40 or minus 50. Yeah, I um because I, I lived in, in uh Nishtivartosk for a short time as well, which is uh, that's way up north. Um and yeah, that gets down pretty cold there. Um, I mean Tumen was cold enough. I um I had to, to here's an interesting thing about Moscow. Do do you um, if you park your car outside your house, like you haven't got a garage or anything, in Moscow, do sometimes do you need to take your battery into your house? Why? <laughs> I'm guessing no. So if it's going to be below minus 30, especially if you haven't got a great car, and or even if you've got a good car, uh, and you haven't got like a block heater for your battery, um, sometimes cold is not a good friend of the battery so uh, it can sometimes suck the power out of the battery and so like the amount of times I would wake up after a minus 30 minus 35 night go to start my car and it just wouldn't start because the batteries died so what I would do sometimes is I would park my car open the bonnet just take the battery with me into my flat and I'd sleep with the battery obviously not with the battery in my bed but you know, <laughs> in in the flat do people in Moscow not do that I don't really know, but uh, well, now I know. If I get a car someday, I will. I will make sure to take out the battery. Mm -hmm. Do you drive? N no, no, not really. I, I think that I'd be a terrible driver. I'm scared for those people, poor people, mm. who would. So no. Yeah, who would uh, fall victim to your uh, to your bumper? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So so, I prefer to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. and not drive but maybe someday i don't know i always think that uh, if other people can do something why can't i same for i don't know anything english proficiency like mm -hmm. if other people can take it why can't i try well may maybe there are several reasons that's that's an interesting question because just because you can do it doesn't mean i mean do, do you believe that we are all born equal in terms of talent, in terms of gifts, in terms of cognitive ability? Mm, not really, but anyway, uh, if you, it's, a, it's, I think it's about determination. If you really want to do something, well, it might take longer for you, but uh, you can do it. So maybe you can't, but that's, that's, that's the sad truth, I think, because you, I think you are just answered your own question say, if, if I can do it, why can't other people? Then I asked you, do you think we're all born equal? No, I think vice versa. If uh, other people can do it, why can't I do it? Oh, I understand. But still, I think, the se I think my argument still works, that if we're not born with cognitive ability at the same level, that's why. I mean, so, some people say that 
you, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. Do you know what that is? That's a lie. Some people are not capable. Some people are not capable of getting past pre-intermediate. It's not in their blood. I firmly believe that. And I, I, do, do you not think so? Because it's a very controversial point, I think. I think some people simply don't have a linguistic brain. The same way I'm not great at math. I don't have a very mathematical brain. Um, I think maybe coming to peace with who you are cognitively, who you are intellectually, makes makes your life a lot easier, don't you think? Mm, you might be right. I'm great at math, <laughs> so I don't really know. I cannot relate. So, but I, I don't know. Mm. Obviously, if uh, you don't have this ear for music, then uh, it will be trickier for you to learn songs and to uh, be excel in uh, singing or whatever, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, because it's um, difficult to say. It is. And it's a very, we, we, I think people are very reluctant to think about intelligence as variable. That's why this sort of, you know, blank slate tabula rasa nonsense is still popular in modern philosophy. Um, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's right. I think people need to, so for example, I don't know if you ever heard of a guy called, um, Alex Rawlings. Um, so he is one of these, um, sort of polyglot guys. I used to live with him in Yaroslavl, uh, when, when we studied together in, on our year abroad. And so he like, he knows 11 languages or the last time I checked, uh, he knew 11 languages. If you go to English file intermediate third edition, there's a lesson there about can and be able, and there's the, the reading exercises. Mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. so that's the guy I used to live with. Um, and in, I think it was in one of his blog posts, or he's got a book and stuff as well. He like, he said, um, people of, often ask me like, what's the secret? How do you, you know, how do you learn so many languages? What's your secret? And I just say to them, there is no secret. Um, it's, you know, it's just hard work. I'm like, mm, that's not really true. You're right, there is no secret, but it's not all hard work. Um, it's also DNA and your luck and your education and, and you know, parenting, of course, but DNA is, is, I think, most of it, more than everything else combined, certainly. Mm, you might be right, you might be right. But you know, um, when I think about it, I, I just, uh, I saw this TED talk and they were uh, talking about uh, something like uh, a little bits of memory or something like that. So uh, the uh, speaker uh, said that he went uh, to uh, interview people who participate in those memory contests, you know, those crazy, 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 crazy people. <laughs> uh, so, and he actually uh, talked to them, uh, trained for a year and uh, won uh, the next contest. That's yes, I, uh, I, I've seen that TED talk. I know the guy. Yeah, um, you say crazy, crazy people. I'm one of those people. No, I'm, I, I don't do contests or anything, but that's one of my hobbies is, is memory training. So I used to do the same thing of memorizing decks of playing cards and stuff. Um, one of my favorite things to do was I've talked about this on another podcast, which hasn't come out yet. Uh, so you won't have listened to it, but it will have come out by the time this comes out, if that makes sense. Um, so one of the things I like to do um, is um, memorizing like the region numbers. So like, you know, Moscow is 77, stuff like that. So I memorized all of those. Um, it's been a while now, so I don't know if I remember them all. But um, you numbers are more difficult because you need, because the way this memory technique works is um, through sounds and associations with those sounds. So what you need to do is come up with a code to give each number a sound. My code was very, very simple. I would just say like the first letter of how that, so like, for example, if I have like um, a three or like, I, I mem remember them in Russian. So like, you know, three uh, is, a, is a, a T sound and Chablidi is a Ch sound. So for example, um, to remember, um, the region number 45. Um, I used to teach a guy um, who was from Kurgan, which is region 45, and he was always, always talking about how uh, the Pilmeni in Kurgan were the best in all of Russia. And he, he, he was kind of joking, but he was like, he always talked about it. Um, and so the number for Kurgan is um, 45, so that's Chupiri uh, Pech. So that was my my clue was Chepo in my head. And so I would I would have an image of a big like Kamaz crashed on the road 
carrying Pilmeni and all the Pilmeni, you know, spilled across the road. And so I remember Chepo with Pilmeni is Kurganska Oblast. And for example, those of like, you know, little um, tricks like that. Um, but you can remember an insane amount of information just by, um, by, by that technique. But you see, you said that you are not uh, great uh, at math, but you can still remember numbers, uh, associating them with uh, letters, etc. So you need to find the trick here. But I, I think that's math. That's not arithmetic. It's, that's but it just... Mm, yeah, but anyway, you know, I, um, I just thought that, yeah, some people are generally better at remembering, for example, numbers. I would never go for me. That's me. I would never go for this kind of associ association things. Mm -hmm. I would just uh, think of numbers. But yeah, it just maybe you need to find your own way. Maybe, maybe. What's your favorite number? I don't know why I want to say 45. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't really know. You don't have a favorite number? I thought you liked math. No, no but it doesn't mean that uh, I should, uh, I like all the numbers. All the positive numbers or all the negative numbers? Just all of them. Okay, all the integers or all the decimal numbers as well? <laughs> okay, so number 13. My, okay, my, dog, uh, okay. my dog's name is 13. Because uh, Respublica Marbluria or... <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna look that up. I'm going to check that I'm correct about that. I've got an app here. Called, if, if anyone wants to practice, then you can download this app called Aftonormer. And okay. 13. Yeah, it is. Phew. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. My favorite number is 52 factorial. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Uh, it's, it's all of the, um, it's all the different uh, permutations of a deck of playing cards. So there's 52 cards in a deck. Yeah. Factorials are really freaky, really, really freaky because it tells you how many different combinations of um, things you can have in, in which order. So, for example, on, on my screen, at the, I don't know about your screen, but on my screen, you're on the left and I'm on the right. Is that how you see it on your screen? No, it's vice versa. You're on the left, I'm... Okay. Yeah, so, so it's the same. <laughs> so, to answer the question, how many different combinations can we have of your face and my face on this screen? It's two factorial. Two times mm -hmm. one. So the answer is two. It could be you on the left or me on the right, or it could be vice versa. Okay, now we ask the question, if we have three people on this Zoom call, how many different combinations could we have? Well, the answer is three factorial. Three times two times one, which is six. So there could be person A and then me and you, or person A, you and me, et cetera, et cetera, and you've got six different combinations. Now, when you get up to... Um, eight people. If there's eight people in this call, how many different combinations do you think we can have? Just, just a you're guess. You're saying that you're not great at math. What do you think? Eight people. Eight factorial. <laughs> now, you yeah. are correct. Um, eight factorial. People often guess, like, if there's eight people on a call, how many different combinations could we have? I don't know, 80, I don't know, 64, something like that. The answer is 40,320. Sometimes I do that as a warmer in a class. If I've got eight people in a class, I can say, okay, how, how should we sit? How many combinations of sitting do you think we can have? 40,320. Factorials are really, really freaky. They're exponentially freaky in every sense of the word exponential. So, on your um, page, um, obviously you do stuff like uh, speaking preparation and Cambridge exam preparation, but I also noticed you, you do um, consultancy work for teachers. Um, what sort of things do you find teachers struggle with that they ask you for help or that you've struggled with your, yourself or that you've, it, that you've read online? What sort of thing do people often need help with? Jenny, you know, um, talking of your podcast, I really liked uh, the questions that you ask. And uh, you talked with Irina, uh, Irina Kozlova, I believe. I, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm mistaken. Uh, and you talked about the struggles uh, with the level and, uh, you know, just uh, 
uh, keeping up uh, and maintaining the level and that's I think that the, ma the main thing mm -hmm. and generally many teachers think that they are not, not good enough they are all perfectionists and they think that um, they will never be good enough to teach advanced levels or uh, up intermediate so they need this kind of Mm. What's the solution to that? Because you you are a lady who has a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of bumashkas. Um, and now I, I, I don't think that you think that a certificate is more important than real knowledge, but perhaps that's the purpose of certificates like that, like to have CELTA or DELTA or to have CPE at a high grade. Um, that's the that's the antidote to this problem of teachers maybe not feeling confident enough to teach high levels. Do you think that that's, that's a good solution to go and get loads of uh, qualifications? Mm, I think it depends. Uh, it depends on the person really, because uh, I got to my SP and I, and I told to everyone that if I get something really good, I will be disappointed, but because it's not true, if I get something really bad, I will also be disappointed. So I will never be happy with uh, whatever I get. So I don't really know. Because is you get this certificate and you don't uh, feel uh, maybe you feel better a little bit, but it depends on your I mean maybe self confidence. Uh, many teachers think you uh, have this uh, kind of uh, what it's called um, uh, syndrome samazvansa. I forgot what's in it's in English. imposter syndrome. <gasps> right. Yeah. It's a nice word that Samozlany, it's uh, imposter, imposter. And it's not only about this imposter syndrome, but it's, uh, for example, if you're like, if you're a spy who's uh, trying to infiltrate their way into a, um, into some sort of circle, it's an imposter. It's going, mm -hmm. Your camera is going really crazy. It's sort of going in focus and out. I shouldn't be moving but right now then. I will, I will try to keep still. What's the point of having a video camera if it can't detect movement? Just get a normal camera. <laughs> We can do a podcast with Polaroids. Oh, dear me. Never mind. Um, so, in the same way that, in my opinion, not everyone can learn a language. I think some people are not capable of learning a language, not in their blood. And it's that sounds like a really harsh thing to say, but I, I hold myself to the same standard. I think it's not in my blood to um, be a great chess player or a great mathematician or, or a great basketball even a, a, a bad basketballer I'm a terrible basketballer I'm five foot seven and not particularly athletic it's not in my blood it's not it's not on the cards for me um so that sounds really harsh but I think I think it is true and I think that's part of realizing your destiny as a person is coming to peace with your with your genetic lot in life um, but then finding where your genetic ceiling is, that's a difficult thing. So, um, you know, maybe it's not possible and maybe you should always, you know, reach for the stars and all of that. Um, but if we assume that's true, if we assume that not everyone's capable of learning a language, do you also think not everyone is capable of becoming a teacher? Hmm. Tricky questions that you're asking. <laughs> I, I don't really know. I think it has to be some kind of calling. You should really like it. If you don't, then no, you cannot become a teacher. Mm -hmm. But if you really have this passion, drive, or you, you want to pass the knowledge, or I think, why not? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. But I think, um, and, and passion and drive is, is definitely one thing, and it's maybe the biggest thing. But I think there's no amount of, because I think, um, especially in the Russian school, uh, the pedagogical school, um, I think um, methodology is, is a big factor of becoming a, a qualified teacher in Russia, uh, as it is in, in every country, of course, but the Russians do always place a lot of emphasis on, on correct methodology. Um, but I think that, you know, hiding behind methodology will only give you so much. Um, I, th I think that the best teachers I've ever worked with or learned from, it's just intuitive. They don't even think about how they deliver the material. It's just natural to them. They just, they know that this is the best way to present it. And of course, that you do need to formalize that in some way. And you do need to have, you know, like a set, um, you know, rubric or a set, um, you know, method of delivering the information. But um, I think something like CELTA or something, you know, like TEFL or DELTA or TKT, 
um, those exams won't save a bad teacher. They will save you a lot of time. Because I, I look back on my first lessons, they were terrible. I can't believe the sort of nonsense I was, I was trying to do in the classroom. I'm sure it's the same with you and, and with every teacher listening to this, but um, those exams, they won't save a bad teacher, but they will save you a lot of time. And do you know what I mean by that? Mm, I, I totally agree that uh, we do learn from our teachers and maybe we uh, take some uh, tricks and things that they do and they are successful and uh, you're totally right that uh, our first lessons are terrible and you kind of uh, progress and see we, uh, what uh, works what doesn't work so mm, I don't really know mm. Mm. I, I think that um, I don't want to speak about the bad teachers because I don't want I am a positive person Ah, As you see, I think that everyone can do mystery. anything. Um, ah, there are no I bad teachers, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you worried about offending potential clients? Is that it? No, not really. No, mm, I I don't know. It's it's just a very. Oh, you know, every time when you speak about something and you answer a question, and I just thought about it. So you answer this question and you uh, take uh, one angle, one perspective, and there, there are uh, many more that you, and many other factors that you have to take into account. So there might be something that uh, I don't know now or I haven't thought about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very um, true. Very true. All right. Um, speaking about different perspectives on different things, um, did I understand? I was, I was having a, a little bit of a stalk of your um, VK page just before um, we started speaking. Um, didn't you used to be a translator? It was my hobby. I actually, uh, okay, so revealing the things. Nobody knows that I live in Spain, only my students uh, do. Uh, well, I. Uh, I worked in a bank for six years when I lived in Moscow and then I moved to, to Spain. Well, I teaching was kind of a hobby of mine and then I decided to make it my profession and I'm really, I'm really happy, I'm really happy. I think that I found something that I really like and never, 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 never again will I go into any office or banking, no, nothing. Mm -hmm. nothing Which bank did kind. you work for? It was just a little bank, small, small, yeah. nobody knows. <laughs> but <laughs> nope. because you know, uh, because you know that uh, in Moscow, well, in January in Russia, there are like uh, thousand, a thousand of banks or something like that. Not like in uh, Europe, there are three, four and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I tend to find that um, you get the banks which are connected with industries which mm -hmm. you get in Siberia a lot. I don't know if it's the same in Moscow, but I find that the longer, the, especially in Russia, the longer the name of the bank, the less I trust them. It's like something like, you know, Zapsipkom Surgutnyevki Gazovy Tam Zelezorozhny Bank. I'm like, mm, no thanks. I'm not putting my money in your bank. Uh, does not look very Yeah, but they usually work with, uh, as you said, that they, it's industry connected and they usually work with those companies in the industry. So not really like... Uh, uh, people, simple, uh, mere mortals. <laughs> mere mortals. But no, you, you, you can go to, you can go to like sort of good if you guys bank in, in, in Chiman, you can open a, a, open an account there. I wouldn't mm, Yeah, it, but, but it's not the, I think it's not the specialization. I think it's just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know about these days. I'm sure these days it's all above board, but I mean, that particular company, sort of good if you guys, they, I think they had a lot of connections with the mob, like a lot of mafia connections in the 1990s. So that um, that particular bank, I'm sure, um, has a rather checkered past. But I'm not basing that on any evidence at all. So um, please don't sue me if you're listening to this. <laughs> she gets bank, which they're definitely not listening. Um, OK, so what sort of stuff did you normally translate? Oh, I uh, translated for this uh, uh, studio. It's called Vertaider. Uh, we would translate well, and they are still translated. Just I don't have time for that. I wish, I wish, maybe one day I have. No, yeah, I can do it again. Uh, so um, yeah, so uh, 
popular science videos, you know, um, Dawkins uh, and uh, everyone, uh, now they are translating uh, lectures of uh, Sapolsky. I don't, I don't really know how to say it in, in English, uh, but uh, yeah. So it's it's uh, it's all very interesting, and I think that maybe one thing that I, uh, my idea is the teachers of English are very interesting, just because they teach and they talk about all these things. Uh, like uh, you will find uh, these uh, environmental issues only in uh, English books, and English teachers are more environmentally friendly, say, because they speak about these topics, and yeah. That's about, uh, and I think that maybe um, it was uh, it was this uh, uh, these videos that I translated. The, there was this kind of a, like a, a card that I would play in my lessons, and uh, you know, awesome. popular science. Yeah, that's um, th those ones are, are quite nice to translate. I find because uh, obviously I've done a, a bit of translation in, in my in my time, both you know um, semi professionally and at university um but the the most um difficult text i've ever had to translate ever had to translate in my life was um this was given to me by a professor at university so the class was russian to english translation and um the the text was is a short story by uh Zoshinka, um called uh Kuchirga. have you ever have you ever read that story no. So the, the whole the whole idea behind the story is I'll I'll, I'll try and I, it's been years since I've read it, but I'll I'll try and describe it in a short way and, and hopefully it'll it'll make sense. I'll probably get it wrong. But basically, um Zoshinka was one of those guys who, as I'm sure you know, was always his genre was satire and parody, and he was always parried parodying um the sort of um you know the new uh Bolshevik elites in this sort of time of avant-garde socialism so that the, the sort of new the new um upper echelons of society uh and you know these partisan types and so there's a story about um as a director of this um factory which makes poker so for anyone listening who doesn't could you guy in english is poker um or fire poker um and so um the the guy who works in the factory who needs a new, this uh, istavshik, I don't know what it would be like, a stoker? I don't know. The guy who, you know, who moves the coals in the furnace. Um, he needs a new poker. And so the, um, you know, the guy is writing a, a, a memo to the central committee saying, um, you know, um, we, uh, and then he's thinking, Kachirgov? Kach and he can't think, like, how to say Kachirga in this um, genitive plural. And so he calls in his secretary and he calls in some other, you know, and, and they're, they're thinking of how to say, could you, and the whole story is about them trying to write this memo and not make a mistake. Um, the answer is Kuchiriog, by the way, for anyone listening, um, Monoga Kuchiriog. Um, but yeah, it, and, and so I had to translate that. I had to translate that into English. And so, and the, there's the bit where the secretary, she's declining the, um, the, the noun kachirga in all the different cases so she's going you know kachirga kachirgan kachirga blah 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 and i listing in all the different cases i had to translate this into english it was impossibly difficult to translate nigh on impossible um but yeah i i gave it a i gave it an effort have you ever read it? we know no we know about the those uh uh car batteries that you should uh, take it out Always. Uh, eight factorial is 40,000 something. 320. <laughs> <laughs> and now, <laughs> <laughs> So now, if we say I, uh, we, we need uh, um, <laughs> eight factorial kuchiryog, please. And we know that number 45 is Kurganskolbus. So it's been, yeah. it's been a, a whirlwind of new understanding and knowledge between us. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you ever tried translating poems? Oh no, no, I think that you need this kind of talent. You need to be talented, maybe write poems in Russian in order to translate them, no? It's hard, it's hard. Um, so I I will often, um, I don't know if you've ever done this, do you ever write little like poems in English to, um, to remember new vocabulary? No, I should try that, but I don't think I am talented enough. 
Oh, no, you, you don't need to write anything. I mean, uh, the, the, the poems that I write in Russian are complete nonsense. It's just the, the only idea is so that I remember new words. Um, and um, recently, so I, I, I have done a, a bit of translating poems in the past. Um, recently, because I, I talked about this a little bit with um, Irina Lutsenko on, on, on our podcast, and I was contacted by a guy, uh, Timur, who, uh, hello, Timur, if you're listening, I'm sure you are, he always listens. Um, he's got a, um, a community on VK. Hang on, I'll try, try and find the name of it. Uh, so that people can go. And if you want to see uh, Timur's translations, uh, slash poetry translations, um, then go, go and check those out. Um, but he contacted me and he said, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then we, we worked, he, um, he critiqued my translation of um, you know, that one that goes, et cetera, that, uh, translated that. Um, but you should definitely give it a go, translate some poems or write some poems in English, because for some reason, I don't know why it is, just the, the, the way that you force different words to rhyme with each other, they just, it just clicks. Certainly, it does for me anyway, something in, in your brain that clicks. Give it a go. Give it a go. Mm -hmm. I will certainly try. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you like reading poems in general, in Russian or in English? Hmm. I don't want to pass as a very uncultural uh, person, but uh, no, not not really. No, I have a couple maybe that I really like mm -hmm. in Russian, but uh, no. I know maybe one in English. Go on. Tell me which which ones do you like. Mm, I like uh, uh, I just don't know I like the rhyme mm. and just the, the message and yeah. uh, the one about the stars mm -hmm. um, I don't know it by heart obviously yeah I, I'm not a big fan of learning poems by heart um, I think um People who try and do that, I think they are more concerned about showing off that they know the poem. It's like I mentioned this in a previous podcast. It's like um, the is a quote by Oscar Wilde: "A gentleman never quotes correctly." I think that's really profound because um, what, what are you more concerned about? Are you more concerned about the message and the content and the meaning of this quotation, or are you concerned about showing people that you know the quotation? You know. Having said that, though. I'm now going to change my tune completely and contradict myself. Having said that, with poetry, a lot of people disagree with me here, but I think with poetry, the form is more important than the meaning. I firmly believe that. I believe that the meter and the rhyme and the structure of the poem is more important because if meaning is your number one priority, you don't need poetry. You need prose. Prose is unbridled and it's unlimited, and you can use prose to express any idea you want. Prose is the ultimate expression of ideas. It's better than film because if you want to know what's going on in someone's head or what someone's thinking, you need prose. But poetry, poetry is structure. Poetry is constraint. If you don't have structure, if you don't have constraint, if you don't have some limits or some rules or some meter, it's pointless. You need prose, not poetry, um, which is why it's so. That's hard. interesting. So it's like music. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. And I, it's like all art. All art is constraint. Um, if you don't, if you don't have constraint, and not only art, a lot like some of the most pleasurable things in life, like sport. People think about sport as, um, you know, purely competition. That is an unbelievably simplistic analysis of something like, like a, a game of hockey or a game of football. If you think that's only competition, you're not paying attention. You need to go and read, you know, a book by Piaget to understand what's really going on. Because the Piagetian analysis of something like a game of, of football, for example, is, OK, yes, fundamentally, we are trying to compete against each other. But all of us um, agree arbitrarily that it's for some reason it's important to put that ball in the net. And we agree that we need to stay within the boundaries of the game and within, within the rules. That's cooperation. 
and each player is trying to do really well on their own, but they also understand that they need to do well as a whole team. Uh, and each of those teams then understand at a different level of analysis that they need to uh, cooperate and be good sportsmen and to, um, to not disrespect each other because the whole league needs to function correctly. And then the whole league, and it's just, you know, it's it, these different levels of cooperation and sort of, you know, metacognition that go on at different levels. Are you? I don't know. I'm. I'm not a sporty person. Um, but um, I don't know. Do you, Do you like? Um, do you like sports? Do you like playing sports? No, not really. But uh, just a month ago, I started walking every day, and I'm proud to say that I do ten thousand steps. Yay! Yay! Are you one of those people who's addicted to their step counter? Kinda, you know, it's all about uh, you know statistics and not uh, into I don't know keeping the streak. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's um it's a tricky one because at some you know in some way we're all addicted to our technology. Um, I am definitely included in that. I'm addicted to my phone, um, and I try to put my phone down and, and make conscious efforts not to pick it up. But what about stuff like exercise apps? Could people get addicted to those exercise apps and those step counting apps? Um, isn't that a good thing? It is kind of, no. Mm -hmm. So whatever keeps you going, because yeah. you know, it's good for our health, for our brain. That's something that you know, uh, someday uh, made me uh, take up exercise. Yeah, I think self care is definitely. Um, you know, it's there's a lesson I do sometimes about values, and one of the questions is which do you which do you value more, your mind or your body? Most people say mind, and I would tend to agree with that. But I think it's a false dichotomy. I think there's mind and body are not two different things. The purpose of the body is to sustain the mind, and if you don't take care of yourself, you don't have an effective self care regime. You need to get enough sleep, drink enough water, uh, eat properly, do exercise. Uh, if, if uh, you know, do, do breathing exercise, meditation, and if you don't do that, then your mind is going to suffer as a result and your progress in English. So in order to uh, improve your English, have a healthy lifestyle, eat properly, um, drink properly, and, uh, and have a good time. <laughs> Perfect. That's our message to end with. Hashtag Zoj. <laughs> um okay Katya, we've been going for an hour so um yeah. i will bid you thank adieu you. or hasta luego as they say in spain um thank you very much for coming on the show and uh it was a real pleasure thank you Ditto. although it was very challenging i must say <gasps> Why? Why tricky questions <laughs> tricky questions we, i mean if you don't like my questions you can you can just um talk about whatever you want to talk about next time it's not a problem but no you did fine thank you thank you, thank you. all right all right, um, bye-bye.